Welcome to America's Heroes Group. And welcome back to America's Heroes Group, this time with our roundtable and our partner, Chicago Regional Office of the Veterans Benefits Administration. September is National Suicide Prevention and Hispanic Heritage Month. Today is Saturday, September 10th, 2022. You heard our host, Cliff Kelly, at the break. I'm Sean Claiborne, the co-host. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith, and our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And we have a panelist on the line with us today. This is Justina Berry. She's a U.S. Army Iraq combat veteran and the Chicago Regional Office Public Contact Representative, and Dennis Overton, Dennis Overton, I'm sorry, U.S. Army Combat Veteran and U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs Public Contact Team member. And we're going to talk about military environmental exposure to burn pits, the legislation that's been passed, and also the VBA process requirements and filing a claim. How are you guys doing today? Good. How are you? Very good. Very good. How are you? Very good. So what is needed to, in order to file a claim? Justina? So what what is needed is the first thing is you need to know if you were previously denied for the condition. And if you were previously denied, then you would need to submit a VA form 0995, which is a supplemental claim. If this is your first time filing for it, then you claim it on a VA form 526EZ. Okay. So what's the process like? Is it a, is it a is this going to be a, a long complicated process in order to get benefits? No, I believe that this will be an easier process because now it's presumptive based on where you served. So you don't have to prove that you had treatment and service for the presumptive list conditions. And this took it seemed like it took a, a while to get this pushed through. What was the, what what finally got legislation um, done in order to help people with these burn pits and this toxic exposure that people have been dealing with for really for years? I think that it was probably the fact that veterans actually, they were the ones that were fighting for these benefits. And as you saw probably in the news, um, John Stewart came through and he was, you know, advocating for veterans just like the September 11th victims. So I think it's just, you know, the time has come to compensate these veterans for the exposures. So, so once again, take a little more detail about the about the process. So, a person files it, files it, get the proper paperwork, they file their claim. Um, then, what's the next step? Okay. Well, the next step um, after they have filed the claim is they will e- they will be set up for an exam and. Um, after the exam, the exam, the results would be given to the writer and then they would be, um, a, the claim would be adjudicated properly. But again, like Justina mentioned, they're, they're, they don't have to prove, you know, that they had treatment and service. So all the veterans need at this point is a diagnosis and to prove that they were actually in the area of uh, Vietnam and um Gulf War areas um, doing a service. And from what I understand, too, they expanded the regions that, were, that are covered now, because before they, they kind of had a more of a narrow, uh, I guess, um, uh, service area, which you could actually claim. But now there's places like Laos and, and Cambodia, all these different places that weren't really included in the previous uh, legislation. Is that correct? Correct. They've actually added five new locations. So um, any U.S. or Royal Thai military base from January 9th of 62 through June 30th of 76, Lyles from December 1st of 65 to September 30th of 69, Cambodia from April 16th of 1969 through April 30th, 1969, Guam or America Samoa or in the international waters off the Guam or America Samoa from January 9th, 1962 through July 30th, 1980, and um, Johnston Atul, or on any ship that caught that was caught at Johnston Atul from January first, nineteen seventy-two, through September thirtieth, nineteen seventy-seven. So, if any veteran served on active duty in any of those locations, um, the VA automatically is assumes that they had exposure to Agent Orange now. What are some of the things that can happen to your body? If you've had some of these toxic exposures, how do you know if you're affected or not? Again, the veterans would need to go um, and be, they, once they file the claim, 
then they would be able to um, go to that CNT exam, and then they would be able to, you know, express their concerns at the exam. Or they can even do that beforehand if they uh, they can go to the DA or their local doctor and get examined. And, and you know, if they have these conditions, then they can file for them. What are some of the things that you're seeing? What kind of conditions are people coming up with? Um, as far as what the new burn pit? With the burn pits? I've heard, I've heard like a lot of strange stuff. I, like I had no idea that even for like Agent Orange expo- exposure, guys are just saying diabetes is like one of the things that you might ha- you might be able to, you might um, develop just from having Agent Orange ex- exposure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now one of the new. Go ahead. I I'm just want to. Um, diabetes is that diabetes is a systemic disease. So if a veteran develops diabetes and they're exposed to Agent Orange, but then later they develop peripheral neuropathy or a kidney condition or hypertension or erectile dysfunction, they can claim that it's due to their diabetes condition. So it seems like it's really critical to go get that exam to get to get checked out to make sure because once again, like you know, people coming back from service, these things may not be might not make themselves known to maybe 10, 15, 20 years after you've been exposed to these things. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. So it's and critical then what to, get, I also, to get to get that get, get checked out. What I would also like to to better mention is that. You know, due to the the COVID pandemic, um, some veterans didn't seek medical treatment, so they can also write their symptoms on, you know, a VA form forty one thirty eight statement in support of claim, so they can discuss the symptoms that they're having, that can, you know, reasonably conclude that it's a disease. You know, you can't self diagnose a cancer, but you can certainly like chronic sinitis, you're competent enough to say that, you know, you have blockages in your nose or you have mucus coming down or uh, post-nasal drip. So you can write a statement discussing your symptoms and the VA will have to accept that as a current diagnosis. Hmm. And what are the dangers for for, for postponing uh, getting an exam? I would say that I mean, ultimately, it's on the veteran. I mean, if they don't go get an exam, then, I mean, it's their health. You know, if they know that they've served in the Gulf or they know that they served during Vietnam and that they had exposure, it's totally up to them, you know, to get, you know, go and be seen. Um, I hear a lot of veterans come in our office and they're furious because they feel like we have to reach out to them and that's not the case. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, we, there's too many resources out here to include, you know, this radio show that they can access and get assistance. So I just want to let, you know, my fellow veterans know that we are here to assist you, but this, it starts with you. This is your claim. This is your life. And it also affects your family out here, too. So, you know, um, if you don't know, whether or not you've been exposed, if you think you've been exposed, if you can't remember, you can they can always come and see us. They also can use VA.gov and simply type in um, Gulf War Presumptive or um, Vietnam Area. I'm um, a Vietnam Era Presumptive, and once they do that, it's going to pull up all the conditions that are presumptive, which means it is presumed that you have this condition due to your service in that area. And I think it's really important for veterans too to understand that because if you're not familiar with the VA system, the, the idea of presumptives is really critical because before you would always have to prove you had some kind of service-connected condition, so something that happened to you in the military. But because it's, pre- it's presumptive now, just by just being in the military at that particular time or being at a certain location, you're automatically going to be pres- assume that you have this. You got this from your military service. Mm-hmm. So are you, are you seeing more veterans taking planned. advantage of this? Are people actually stepping forward and saying, hey, you know what, maybe I need to get checked out? I have seen an influx of veterans since the PAC that has passed come in our office now, and they have questions, and they want to know 
if it applies to them, they want us to, you know, check their service. A lot of a lot of them, you know, don't remember, and so that's fine, you know, and we're able to tell them yes or no. Hmm. So I have definitely seen, you know, I, um, veterans, and then I, I've met up with doing other out, outreaches just this past week, you know, also, and was able to help two people and, you know, ultimately, you know, get their claim started for these new um, conditions. Hypertension is a really, really, really big one. It wasn't presumptive before to Vietnam, and now it is. Hmm. So that's really, really, really um, a huge one. Wow. And then so when, when the veterans are, are filing for these, uh, for these different, making these claims, um, what's the timeline look like? Is it, something, is, it, is it a long process once you fill these forms, once you get seen by a doctor? How long does this all take typically before you actually get treatment? Um, they can, the veterans can go get treatment when, you know, that's up, again, that's at their discretion. We, you know, we're the benefit side of this, so we don't tell them when they can go get treated. That's totally up to them. They can go whenever they see fit. As far as their claim go, however, once the, it generally can take up to 140 days. However, um, it is very important for the veterans to understand that if, like Justina said, if you have been previously denied and you apply for this, um, or reapply and are granted, this, uh, the your effective date will only go back to the date that the law came, became effective. Additionally, they will not start processing any of these claims until January 2023. Okay. So just to put that out there. And then once you file it, from the, generally from the time the veterans file their claims to CMP exam to adjudication, it generally takes up to 100. It can, it can take up to 140 days. Hmm. So what can you tell veterans to, to, to make their process smoother? What are some of the things that they need to do to be prepared when they file a claim? I would say that they need to submit a current medical diagnosis. So whether that be through their treatment at the VA Medical Center or if they get treatment at a private um, doctor's office, they can just write on their application form the name of the doctor or to actually speed it up, if they actually submit their private medical evidence, that would probably speed up the claim process. Another thing that they can do is they can make sure that they file their application on the proper form. So that's why I think it's a good idea for the veteran to either call our National Contact Center to figure out if they were previously denied to make sure that they're submitting their application on the proper form so that that doesn't delay their claim processing time. Because if it's submitted on the incorrect form, then the veteran service representative would have to send a letter out and that would delay the process. Hmm. And so if someone's been denied, you mentioned this before, but if someone's been denied, uh, what's the process like for that person? Do, do they, what type of form do they need? And then how, and how hard is it to correct mistakes that they've made on their first claim? So I think that the PACT Act makes it easier because now that the condition is presumptive, that could be a reason why they were denied because previously a veteran could have claimed um, a condition directly due to service, but it was denied because the examiner couldn't link it back to service. But now that the condition is presumptive, then that opens up the, the benefit. Hmm. And then uh, for as far as uh, applying for disability benefits, so how does that process work? And then also, um, what are some of the, the, the hurdles to trying to prove disability? Well, again, um, in order for the, you know, the veterans can do uh, a multitude of things in order to file for their disabilities. Uh, for starters, they can actually come in and see us. They can make an appointment to see if, if they don't have a representative or, you know, even if they do have a representative, they can make an appointment to come in and see us. Um, or they can make an appointment for us to give them a call, which was, which is considered to be a virtual appointment. You, they can do this one of two ways. They can call the National Contact Center at 
727-1000. And um, they can tell them that they would like to make a schedule an in-person appointment or a virtual appointment with the Chicago Regional Office. The veterans can then um, either come in or we'll give them a call. And once they go through the proper ID protocol, we can pull up and, you know, look at their DD-214 and then go from there. Or the veterans can um, can go through VA.gov. They can go to um, search and then go to VA facility. Type in their zip code. Once they type in their zip code, they'll you know it'll um, the VA benefit. The, um, it, they will select VA benefits office, and then Chicago Regional Office will come up, and then they can make their appointment that way. To so either again come in person and see us or have us, they can schedule a virtual appointment and that's where we would give them a call if they simply do not know. Hmm. Because it's just a matter of us looking at their DD-214 and seeing whether or not they serve during the time frame in the correct area in order for them to be considered for these presumptives. And then what, so what do you see uh, veterans not taking advantage of the most? So if you're going to give it, uh, veterans advice as to what they should be taking advantage of, what are some of the benefits you would say that they should be doing? I Well, for starters, I think that if they don't know, then they should make the appointment and give us a call. I mean, you know, make an appointment to come and see us, and um, we can go from there. Everything from educational benefits to assistance with um, this, these new presumptives to even filing a claim. I've seen and encountered so many people that didn't even know they can file a claim due to not knowing or not being educated. Um, so they don't take advantage of the fact that they definitely can file claims. Um, a lot of times um, I'm, I've heard a lot of stories about people just wanting to leave. So when they left service and, the you know, the VA people was there, the DAD people was there, the IDVA was there, and American Legion was there, they ran right past some tables and kept on with their lives. Wow. And then, you know, 20 years later comes, now they got all these acts and pains, they went to the VA or they was in a grocery store and heard somebody talking about, oh, I got service connected at 70%. Oh, I got this. And then it clicks in their head that, they could have been being compensated for the past 10, 15, 20 years. So can, can someone get retroactive benefits? Huh? Can they get retroactive benefits? Say a person um, uh, 20 years down the road wants to apply and try to get retroactive benefits. Is that possible? Um, I think it, it would I depend if they had an intent to file in, in the system. Yeah. So intent, mm -hmm. what an intent to file does is that it holds the effective date. So let's say we have callers on the line right now that are unsure if they were exposed or if they, you know, have a current diagnosis. I would encourage them to call the 1-800-827-1000 number to file an intent to file so that that will give them one complete year to gather their evidence and then submit their complete application, which would include the diagnosis, the proper form, and we can go back to that date of intent to file. Hmm. So it seems like it's really critical for people just to really just, just start the process, because it seems like, because that's one of the things I think a lot of veterans are kind of worried about, particularly now that more information is getting out there about toxic exposure, particularly with burn pits and the chemicals that you're dealing with in the military, things like that, is that people don't know if something's going, if something's going to trigger in their body down many years down the road. And it seems to scare a lot of veterans. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So it doesn't hurt to go get an exam and it does, but you know, and see where you stand physically or even mentally. So I would encourage everybody, you know, under the sound of my voice that are listening, to if you have any doubt or if you have any questions about your health and whether or not you could have possibly got an issue or have an illness because of service, just go get checked out. You can go to the VA or go to your private doctor, and, you know, whatever suits you best. That's then, the first step right there. And I think that's, I think that's a good word of advice because, like I, like we mentioned before, so, so many people were affected by these, these toxic exposures. I mean, millions of veterans around the world 
being exposed to burn pits, being exposed to, you know, all kinds of these crazy, toxic ex- ex- uh, chemicals, Agent Orange, the list goes on and on. You know, so people, I mean, guys, you got to get checked out. You got to get your, now, people that are in the guard who necessarily didn't necessarily get deployed overseas, is there any difference um, as far as how they can claim or any requirements or any, or is it harder for someone who's not deployed to get um, to get seen or treated while the file a claim versus someone who's been deployed? I think the, the yeah. same rules would apply for service connection. So if you're in the National Guard and you injured yourself during a drill, you can still file a claim. So I, we hear from a lot of National Guardsmen and reservists that even were previously denied service connection because the VA stated that they didn't have the condition in service. But you know, sometimes they go back to their company commander and they get a line of duty determination. They resubmit that evidence as new and relevant evidence with their VA form 0995 supplemental claim. And then, you know, that can get them service connected. Hmm. So it's a a matter of also being diligent as far as making sure that that if you get denied, that you don't just give up and say it's over with, but kind of stay in the fight and make sure that you're sticking up for yourself, so to speak? Yes, I think I think you're right on point because a lot of veterans, when they get denied, they get very discouraged. They say, you know, VA is not here to support me. But sometimes it could be, you know, a piece of evidence that's missing out there. So it's all about, you know, researching why you were actually denied so that we can assist you in getting that new evidence. Would it make sense for veterans, uh, particularly if they if they're in, if they're still communicating with their some of their old uh, uh, members in their units and things like that, to, to maybe do this not on your own, but maybe uh, doing filing claims with your uh, fellow soldiers or federal veterans? As yes, a we've mechanism? seen that a lot. Yes, we've seen that quite a few times where um, you can get a buddy statement. So if you if you served with somebody. And, you know, you witnessed, you know, Soldier Smith, you know, fall and trip trip and, you know, twisted his ankle, but he never went to sick call. You can write that statement for him and say, you know, I was serving with this soldier at this time. I witnessed him, you know, fall and trip. And that can potentially be new and relevant evidence. Hmm. Wow. That's, that's good advice because, like I said, many a time, many a time, a lot of veterans, like I said, are very, very nervous about stepping forward. I think some of it, personally, I think it says people don't want to hear the bad news. They're they they're almost almost as if they're trying to avoid he- hearing something negative about their body or finding out that there's something wrong with them. So they don't they don't want to step forward or file a claim. Do you see that at all? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we see that we we see that a lot. Like they just they give up and they just you know they they don't they don't want to hear the bad news. And you know sometimes the bad news came at the wrong timing because we didn't receive that evidence at that time. So I would mm-hmm. say to anybody listening, please, you know, if you were denied something. Just you can request a Freedom of Information Act. You can get your records. You can actually research why you were denied so that you can get the evidence to, you know, reopen your case. And there's no mm-hmm. and, and there's no harm in going back again and again. If you're getting if you get told no three times, you can still go back three more times. Is that right? Right. That is correct. Because our new um, appeals. You can do a supplemental claim within a year. You can do a higher level review claim, or you can send it to Washington, D.C., to the Board of Veterans Appeals. So you have more options now to appeal your claim and to get service connected. So what what advice would you give uh, soldiers and veterans who are filing a claim and want to have the best chance of success, what are some of the things you would mention to them to to make sure that they do some of the do's and don'ts of filing a successful claim? I would say that the veterans need to be proactive in their claims. Um, A lot of times they think that, you know, oh, I just went and filed paperwork, so that's it, I'm going to just sit and wait. No, they have the right to 
um, know what the status is, and they also, when they leave the office, they need to uh, make sure that they understand everything that was just that just happened in the meeting, from the claim process to what happens after that, to the time frame, to the statements that they write, the statements that their buddies write, all of that. They need to understand that they have to be proactive in their claims because it is their claim. Um, and additionally, um, the gatherings, making sure that they are proper, that they have the diagnosis for the condition that they have, uh, that they're claiming, because without a diagnosis, you will be denied. So, mm. so please make sure that before you file a claim, uh, please make sure that you all are diagnosed with that condition. Um, and, uh, and lastly, if the condition is not presumptive, making sure that they have the correct evidence um, to support their contention. So be it a, a statement from them, because a lot of times they don't have, we see that the veterans don't have a link to service, and the link could be a doctor providing a statement, um, or even sometimes them writing their own statement, or their buddies or their friends that serve with them writing a statement or their medical ev evidence while in service. So that's also important as well for them to make sure they have the sufficient documentation that they need um, when they're filing their claims. I think that's w words to live by. I think it's very important. Veterans, go out there and make sure you have your documentation. Make sure you get checked out. File your claims while you are eligible and able to do it. File your claims. This is Justina Berry. She's a U.S. Army Iraq Combat Veteran and the Chicago Regional Office Public Contact Representative. And Donis Overton. She's a U.S. Army Combat Veteran and works with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs Public Contact Team member. Thanks for your time and also the information you've given us. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure. This is America's Heroes Group. We'll be right back. <laughs>